continuation to the last lecture where we we, we started with Aristotelian syllogistic logic. Um, there we discussed various kinds of categorical propositions. Uh, this can be an A proposition can be like this: all men are mortal. I proposition is some men are mortal, and O proposition is some men are not mortal, and E proposition stands for you know, no men are mortal. So depending upon uh, what distributes what and all. Uh, we, we have classified these uh, uh, categorical proportions in terms of quality and quantity. So, these uh, categorical propositions combine in certain way and they will form uh, categorical syllogism and all. Categorical syllogism consists of uh, at least two categorical propositions as premises and another categorical proposition as conclusion. So, today we will be discussing about Aristotelian theory of uh, categorical syllogisms and then we will also discuss about various uh, valid uh, rules of uh, inference and then uh, we, we, we also discuss about uh, immediate inferences etcetera and all. So, to start with what we mean by a categorical syllogism. So, the definition of a categorical syllogism is like this it is obviously a deductive argument having a sequence of three and only three categorical propositions you know in this uh, categorical syllogism there should be only three and only three propositions out of which two will serve as premises and the other one will serve as a conclusion. So, it is a deductive argument in a sense that conclusion necessarily follows from the premises and all and there is no new information in the conclusion etcetera all the properties of deductive arguments works uh, well here. Uh, not only the thing, not only the thing that they have only three categorical propositions, but they have three and only three terms appear in a sequence of statements. For example, uh, any sentence, any categorical proposition has uh, two terms, subject and predicate term. But the three terms that we are referring to are like this: subject term, and predicate term, and the middle term. So each one of these terms uh, occurs at least uh, twice in these uh, three uh, propositions. You know. So, each term appearing in exactly two propositions uh, the way in which this term the, the terms of the uh, syllogisms are arranged in is what we call it as the figure of the syllogism. So, the idea here is is that uh, middle term is the term which uh, which you will see only in the premises and whereas subject and predicate terms you will see in uh, at least one of the premises and uh, and uh, and one in one of the conclusions and all. So, these terms at least occurs twice in the uh, whole argument now. The only thing which you need to note is, is that middle term will not appear in the conclusion. So, one example of a categorical syllogism is this thing. Suppose if you say all astronaut astronomers are scientists, some astrologers are not scientists and from that the third proposition is a conclusion that is some astrologers are not astronomers. So, this forms uh, a kind of categorical syllogism. Now, Aristotle has presented his theory of syllogism in which you know we will come to know how uh, whether or not some astrologers are not astronomers follows from the two given categorical propositions that are all astronomers are scientists, some astrologers are not scientists. You know. So, for that what we need to do is first we need to identify the terms that exist in this categorical syllogism. So, these are like this. So, what I said in the beginning was uh, middle term is the term which exists uh, at least uh, which exists only in the premises, but you will not find it in the conclusion. So, the middle term of a categorical syllogism is the term that occurs once in each premise, it occurs only in the premises, but it will not occur in the conclusion. So, in this case, the one which is in the red, red, uh, red color is the one which you will see in the premises. So, all astronomers are scientists and some astrologers are not scientists they are considered to be premises and the third one here is a conclusion. So, scientist is the term which occurs only in the premises that is why it is called as a middle term and, and first you need to observe the conclusion. The conclusion here is some astrologers are not astronomers. So, uh, here the subject term is astrologer we are talking about the conclusion and the predicate term of the conclusion is astronomers. 
So whenever the predicate term occurs in the premises and that is considered to be the major premise whenever the subject term occurs in your premises then that is called as a minor premise. The other way around you can say that astrologers is the subject term is called as a minor term and astronomers is considered as a major term whereas the middle term is scientists now. So how do why do we need to find out all these things we need to find out what is a major premise and what is a minor premise now major premise is a premise in which you will find the predicate term the predicate term here is astronomers. So as you will see here clearly in this example the first premise astronomers figures out so that is why that preposition that categorical proposition all astronomers are scientists is considered to be a major premise and the subject of a conclusion that is the astrologers here is considered to be the minor term and whenever this minor term occurs that categorical proposition is considered to be uh, the premise uh, which is referring to this categorical proposition is considered to be a minor premise. So one is a major premise and two is a minor premise and then of course uh, third in third one is the conclusion. It is a standard convention that you should ensure that always you state the major premise first followed by that minor premise and of course there is a conclusion. So how do we know why, why are we studying all these things because we need to judge uh, whether this particular kind of syllogism is a group of uh, categorical propositions out of which two are uh, two are serving as premises and the other one is uh, serving as a conclusion. So how do we know that the premises are leading to the conclusion that makes this syllogism valid that is what is our motivation and then Aristotle has come up with a wonderful theory which is very closer to the natural language and then uh, Aristotle has come up with this theory of syllogism in this way. Uh, the first and foremost thing which you need to know before presenting this Aristotelian theory of syllogism is another concept which is called as mood. Mood is not the, the one which we, we are talking about which mood you are in and all what kind of mood you are in it is a different kind of thing it is a form of argument and all. So for example if you have no birds are mammals all bats are mammals so no bats are birds the first preposition is a e preposition and the second one is a, a preposition that means all men are mortal like that and the third one is a e preposition. So the mood of this preposition is e a e. So another kind of uh, uh, categorical syllogism which has uh, uh, which which is like this no mammals are birds that is a e preposition all mammals are bats that is a, a preposition and the other one no bats are birds that is usually served as a conclusion so that is a e preposition. So this is also called as e a e preposition but both of these uh, syllogisms have the same mood but their uh, logical form is different and all. So although they have the same mood and all e a e but the logical form in a sense that how the middle term is distributed etc and all they are a little bit different from uh, the second argument. So, so in the first argument the middle term takes the position of predicate and uh, uh, in the case of uh, uh, the second categorical syllogism the middle term takes the position of the subject. So these are uh, the things you know although two categorical syllogisms have same kind of mood but the logical form might be different. So this is the first thing which we need to know first thing we need to know is four kinds of categorical propositions A, E, I and O and depending upon the quality and quantity we have classified into different kinds of categorical propositions and then these categorical propositions combine in certain way and they will form some kind of uh, thing which, which we are calling it as a mood. So same mode but you can have different logical forms. So now based on how the middle term is distributed what is the middle term middle term occurs twice in the premises so that you will not find it in the conclusion suppose in the categorical proposition you find a middle term in the conclusion that is a it is not a valid kind of argument first of all forget about the validity you should not use you should, the middle term should not come in the figure out in the conclusion. 
So now based on how the middle term is distributed uh, according to Aristotle we have four possible figures. So figures are uh, in uh, combination of different kinds of categorical propositions and in these categorical propositions what we need to look for is where the middle term is placed. So there are four kinds of categorical statements or prepositions A, E, I and O and there are three categorical statements per categorical syllogism that means any categorical syllogism will should have only three categorical propositions. You might ask what happens if I have more than three categorical propositions in all. So these will reduce to only two in all for example all men are mortal so uh, all men uh, all donkeys are cats uh, all cats are dogs something like that three propositions are there then uh, first two combine will form another categorical proposition and that categorical proposition combine with the fourth one and ultimately you will have only two categorical propositions and then the fourth one is the conclusion. If you have more than uh, two categorical propositions of course it presents problem to the Aristotelian model and all but it works nicely for uh, categorical propositions uh, three categorical propositions out of which one is a conclusion. So now we have four categorical propositions A, E, I and O and and you have only three categorical propositions which will form a syllogism. So that is why we have four cube that is four into four into four that is 64 possible moods which are possible for each and every figure. So what is a figure? Uh, he has nicely uh, he has come up with a wonderful idea that uh, depending upon how the middle term is distributed in these categorical propositions he has classified into four different figures in all. As you observe it in these figures clearly that the, the conclusion is always in the in the format that subject and predicate in all. But the only thing which is different here is uh, the middle term in all. For example in the first figure in the first premise middle term occupies the position of a subject and in the second premise of first fig figure number one middle term occupies the position of a predicate and in the in figure two uh, middle term occupies the position of predicate. So each categorical proposition has subject and predicate in all I mean any sentence will have a subject and predicate for example if you say all men are mortal mortality is attributed to the middle to all men and all men is a considered to be subject all men are mo mortality is nothing but a predicate some kind of property or something like that. So as you will see clearly in these figure uh, figures obviously the conclusion is always in the form uh, in the form of subject and predicate but the only thing which is different here is the position of the middle term is different in all these figures and all. So for example uh, moods can be like this a A A A A E A I A O or any particular kind of combination will form a particular kind of mode it can be E E E or E A A all these things will form a particular kind of mode. So each figure will have 64 possible modes and then the first figure will have 64 modes second figure will have 64 and the figure 3 also 64 and 64 ultimately you will have 256 syllogisms possible this is a wonderful construction of uh, Aristotle there are few things which are exciting in all even in the natural sciences also the periodic table which is developed by Mendeleev which is, which is, which is very aesthetic in nature and all it, it conveys a lot of information. So the one which you are going to see we are seeing right now that is based on how the middle term is distributed he has classified these syllogisms in nicely into these four groups now it is some kind of analogy you might find it in Mendeleev's periodic table or maybe the uh, origin of uh, benzene structure etc these are wonderful innovations and all uh, this there is something great about this uh, kind of figures. So only 256 syllogisms can be possible and all so out of that Aristotle has come up with uh, some kind of valid rules of uh, uh, syllogism with which he could come to the fact that there out of this 256 syllogisms 15 are unconditionally valid I will talk about what I mean by unconditional validity and 9 are considered to be 
conditionally valid and all. So that means according to Aristotle's theory of syllogism 24 out of 256 syllogisms are considered to be <coughs> valid syllogisms and all. Not all kinds of combinations will give us valid syllogism, valid syllogism in a sense that uh, for example if you have e, e, e for example that may not be a valid kind of syllogism and all. however well it falls into figure 1, figure 2, figure 3 or anything. So now what we are going to do uh, here is, is that we are, we are just trying to see how the Aristotle has classified these syllogisms into these 4 different figures. So there is one more thing which we need to uh, note the first figure is considered to be the uh, the most standard kind of uh, thing. So all the moods that are falling in figure 2, figure 3, figure 4 can be reduced to the figure 1 and all that means uh, so this is considered to be the most standard kind of uh, uh, figure that you will commonly see in Aristotelian theory of syllogisms all the other things which fall in figure 2, figure 3 etc for example if you have A A E 2 that means uh, that stands for uh, a categorical syllogism A A A and it falls in figure number 2 that means the middle term will be occupying the position of a predicate. So these are some of the things uh, which uh, Aristotle has come up with now we need to find out how Aristotle has come up with the validity of only these 15 syllogisms which are considered to be unconditionally valid. So I will go into the details of this little bit later but Aristotle has uh, named these uh, syllogisms with, uh, with nice names and all Greek names. So the first figure only these 4 are valid A A A uh, there are some ways to remember this particular kind of uh, uh, syllogisms and all these are called as mnemonics. So they use lot of mnemonics to a uh, kind of mugging up this whole kind of thing you know. If you remember this mnemonics and all it is like a poem if you remember the poem we can understand everything about this validity of a syllogism and all. So I will go into the details of this poem little bit later. So which, which is considered to be a syllogistic poem which is quite popular. Uh, so the first one uh, has a name Barbara and all. So as you see here clearly the vowels that occur in this uh, term Barbara that is A, A and A only. These are the vowels A, E, I, O, U are vowels and all whenever you find this vowels uh, corresponding to this particular kind of thing. So that is having A, A, A form. Another thing is sila rent that means uh, in this sila rent uh, the first oval is E, second oval is A and the third oval that you that, that you come across in the in a particular order is E. So that is why it is a E A E categorical proposition and Dari is this thing A the first oval is A and the second oval is I and I. So not only the uh, thing that uh, these uh, ovals corresponds to the mood of a syllogism which are considered the valid syllogisms and all but the other letters consonants also are going to convey some kind of information here. So which we will talk about it when we analyze syllogistic poem into a greater detail but our concern now is to, to know when these syllogisms are going to be valid and when syllogisms are going to be unvalid that means when the argument is valid when the argument is invalid. In the same way second figure where the middle term occupies the predicate position E A E A E E E I O A O O these are considered to be, considered to be the moods which are uh, is going to be unconditionally valid and all. So the other thing is Bocardo O A I E I O I A I A I I uh, is considered to be valid in the third figure the fourth figure is E E I A I and E I O. So these are some of the things uh, which we need to uh, uh, which Aristotle has come up with and these are unconditionally valid there are some other kind of conditionally valid syllogisms so they are like this in the first figure in addition to A E A E A I I etc and all uh, these are also considered to be conditionally valid depending upon the subject term is empty or non empty and all. So Aristotle one, one important thing which you need to note is, is that Aristotle 
takes it for granted that all the terms are considered to be non empty you know they are not going to be empty sets for example if you say unicorn and all that is not permitted in Aristotelian logics you know because it is an empty set set of unicorns which do not exist it is a set of ghosts set of vampires etc all these things are empty sets so it, it will not exist you know. so that is an empty set which we are not supposed to take into consideration but modern logic can take into consideration that for example you can take into consideration all unicorns are intelligent that may be assumed to be true and all but according to Aristotle if you assume that thing to be true then it leads to a fact that uh, there exists some unicorns which are considered to be intelligent that means unicorns actually exist which is not the case it is an empty set so in Aristotelian theory of syllogism that is not permitted which sets limits to Aristotelian theory of syllogism which we will talk about it when we discuss existential import in uh, greater detail that will address this particular kind of problem. So what we are seeing at this moment is, is that uh, he has classified these uh, syllogisms into four different figures and then he says that uh, 64 moods I mean that is uh, corresponding to some kind of argument or syllogism categorical syllogism and then uh, out of this 64 uh, in figure 1 there are only 4 which are unconditionally valid and uh, 2 are unconditionally valid. So like this we have 15 plus 9 24 syllogisms that are going to be valid out of 256 kind of syllogisms that are possible. You know. So so here is a uh, poem with which uh, in those uh, old days they could remember the I mean the validity of uh, the syllogisms with the help of the poem. You know. So the poem in the first appearance is uh, like this and then the second appearance is the one which we are going to take into consideration these are all Latin or Greek names. So if you can by heart this particular kind of poem then you can understand all the 24 kind of uh, syllogisms that you are seeing that you have seen earlier. So first one is Barbara, Silleran, Dari, Feriocu, Prioris that means the first kind of uh, figure. Cesari, Chemistres, Festino, Barocco, Secunda, second kind of uh, second figure, and Tertia, Grandi, Sonas, etc. This is some kind of thing, actual translation, uh, we do not know what it is. So, sec in that third figure, the Rapti, Philopton, Dysamis, Datisi, and all these grat Latin names, which are going to be valid syllogisms, and then followed by that, we have Caminis, Demaris, Fisapo, Fresisan, etc. So this is not what is of importance to us. What is important for us is you can come up with your own mnemonic and all. But the idea here is is that we need to focus on the vowels that exist in these Latin words and all. So they they tell us what kind of syllogism is valid in what kind of figure and all. This poem we will analyze it little bit later, but so before that uh, we, we are going to consider just uh, for the sake of uh, this thing we will consider some examples uh, uh, and then we will see whether this particular kind of syllogism is valid or invalid with the help of uh, this particular kind of uh, thing. For example if you have an argument like uh, this thing uh, no uh, B is A some examples we are trying to consider no b is a the first one and the second one is let us say all c is b and then this is the third categorical proposition so that is no c is a so now suppose if you are given this particular kind of syllogism how do we know that this is valid or invalid so now um, the first thing which you need to note is to identify the terms in this particular kind of syllogism. So now first come to the conclusion so that is the subject term of a conclusion this is the conclusion the subject term is called as a minor term and the predicate term of a conclusion is a major term and then whatever occurs twice in the premises so that is this B. 
So, this is what is called as middle term this is the first one which we need to identify. So, whenever you find a minor term in this premises that is called as a minor premise wherever you will see this major term the major term here is E. So, wherever you will see this major term that is called as a major premise. So, now wherever you find the term A this is called as major premise because you will find major terminal here A and now this is called as minor term minor premise. So, now there is a convention that in the standard format you always state the major premise first for example, in a categorical proposition this comes first and all. So, you need to change it to change it to in this particular kind of order based on the middle uh, the minor and major terms of your conclusion. So, this is in a standard format only and this uh, so now the second one which you need to note is uh, this uh, particular kind of thing. So, based on how the middle term is distributed so we have this particular kind of thing. So, what we have said was uh, in the first figure figure 1. So, the middle term is like this middle term occupies the subject position here and of course, it does not matter whether it is predicate or subject and all m p s m and this is p m uh, s m figure number 2 just state it like this. So, so now middle term occupies the position of a predicate and all. So, now the second one is the third one is m p m s it occupies the position of a subject and this is figure 3 and figure 4 figure 4 middle term is like this p m and m s. So, now there are some ways to remember it and all. So, this uh, diagram goes like this. So, this is where you have your middle terms are there in the first one and then middle term is here so and then followed by that again there is something. So, these two and then of course, uh, the middle term occupies this particular kind of position. So, this is what is considered to be the thing which you take into consideration. So, this is a diagonal and this is go this goes like this and then you have middle term here and then this and then followed by that you have another diagonal here. So, with the, with the help of diagrams you can also understand where the middle term is distributed and all. So, this goes like this the diagram goes like this m m and then this is m this is m that is what we have done two lines and all first of all and then after that this goes like this. Okay, forget about uh, this uh, particular kind of diagram. Now, uh, we need to find out what kind of mode it this particular thing has. So, now we have to identify the middle term first middle term occupies this position and this one. So, now this is what is called as uh, middle term is like this m and then this is also here m. So, that means uh, it falls under uh, the, uh, the figure 1 because the middle term occupies this position here and this one and of course, in all these cases the conclusion is always s and p subject and predicate and all because each sentence has obviously the subject and predicate. So, this one all C is V no C is A. So, this is uh, what is the preposition here this first of all this is an E preposition because no A no B's are A's and all no cats are dogs like that and then this is a, e, a preposition and again this is a E preposition. 
So now the mood mood of this thing is E A E and then we need to state whether it falls under figure 1 or figure 2 or figure 3 or figure 4. So E A E since the middle term uh, middle term occupies the subject position here and here in the in the case here it is a predicate position. So it looks like that this is the thing in all E A E 1. So now you will see here E A E 1 uh, for example in the first figure A A A E A E 1 that is obviously a valid kind of uh, kind of argument and all this is what is called a Siller and all. So as you clearly see that E A E 1 is a valid kind of argument. For example if you change this thing into so that is why this is what is called as valid according to Aristotle but we did not come to know how it is valid and all for that we need to state rules and all little bit later we will state these rules and all in a minute from now. So this E A E 1 will tell us the entire thing about this particular kind of syllogism and all. So E A E is a mode and then it falls under figure number 1 as you have seen in the thing Aristotle makes this thing as a valid kind of syllogism and all. For example for the sake of argument you try to change these particular kinds of things in the words here this you keep it like this only so instead of this say C and B and A for randomly you take into consideration this one and of course this C should not come here because middle term should not come in the conclusion this is the one which you have. So now we need to find out what is the major premise and what is the minor premise etc. Of course in this case A is a major term and then B is a minor term. So whenever you have this minor term that is considered to be a minor premise and whenever you have this major term in the premises that proposition is called as a major premise premise is called as a major premise. So A occurs here so this is a major premise and then minor premise wherever it occurs is usually called as a minor premise. So usually our convention is, is that you state the major premise first and the minor premise Right. So now this is all C is A that is the first one we need to rechange it a little bit and the second one is no C is B and then of course the conclusion is same that is no B is A of course this B C is A's can be anything donkeys cats or any other thing anything you substitute it you will come to know whether it is a valid or invalid kind of argument. When you have true premises and a false conclusion obviously it is an invalid kind of argument we are trying to see whether which figure it falls in. So now we have this particular kind of standard kind of format so now we need to observe the middle term middle term is occupying the subject position here and then of course whether it is predicate or not it does not matter and subject predicate is always going to be the conclusion and all. No, we have, this can be a subject term or it can be a predicate term and all so it does not matter much and all but we are interested in how the middle term is distributed and all and now middle term is occupying the subject position in both the premises and all. So now this is not the one which you are looking for this is also not the one because it occupied the predicate position and the one which you are looking for is this one because this seems to be closer to this particular kind of thing. So now of course this is a minor term and this is a major term and of course now we have written it in order major term major premise and minor premise 
major premiss and my minor premiss and then of course. So, now we need to find out the mood of this particular kind of thinking out. So, now the first one is an A preposition all C's are A's etcetera and the second one is no C's is B that is a E preposition these two are serving as premises to us and the third one is obviously the conclusion that is also E and all. So, now the middle term is distributed like this and something else here some other term. So, this is closer to this particular kind of thing M M and P S. So, now this is figure number 3. So, now Aristotle says that now we need to look for whether A E E is going to be valid or not in the third figure. So, now you will see here in the third figure only O A I E I O I A I A I, I these are going to be valid kind of forms now you do not find A E E corresponding to figure 3 which is going to be valid and all. Of course, A E E is valid in the fourth figure, but we are not getting that particular kind of thing. The, the one which we are having is A E E corresponding to the third figure based on how the middle term is distributed. So, you will not find A E E here. So, that is why it is an invalid kind of argument. Maybe you can look for the conditional validity you need to see whether the third figure third figure also you will not find this uh, particular kind of thing A E E kind of thing you find only uh, A I E A O etcetera they are considered, considered to be conditionally valid it is not even conditionally also valid. I did not talk anything about conditional validity I will talk about it a little bit later when I talk about existential import. In a simple nutshell at this moment conditional validity means uh, it presupposes uh, that your subject for example, in the first case first figure A A I and E A O they are considered to be conditionally valid in the sense that the subject term is non empty. So, there means there are some kind of subject terms which are actually existing in the world and all. So, in the same way uh, in the second figure A E O E A O are considered to be again val conditionally valid again based on whether or not the subject term actually exists that means whether or not it is empty or non empty you will judge you can judge whether they are going to be conditionally valid or not. So, now how do we know that these particular kind of categorical syllogisms are valid and some particular kind of categorical syllogisms are invalid. So, Aristotle has come up with five interesting rules with which you can judge whether or not a given categorical syllogism is valid or invalid. For all these things what what is important here is to identify these terms in the syllogism. First is the middle term, of course, the major term and the minor term. Uh, so, these are the things which you need to uh, identify, and then you should ensure that your middle term does not occur in the conclusion, it occurs only in the premises, it occurs twice in the premises. So, the first rule is, is that the middle term of a valid syllogism is distributed at least once in the premises. So, for uh, uh, distribution we have come up with uh, one particular kind of uh, a mnemonic. So, that is like any student earning I am writing it in capital letters for the sake of identifying this particular kind of thing earning uh, B, B grade for example, B is not on probation. So, before that we have another uh, mnemonic that is affirmo ni go all these things are very important and then we will use these things a little bit later. That means universal propositions like A and I are affirmative and negative prepositions are E and O they are considered to be negative kind of prepositions. And all. So, this is the one which is going to be very important and all with this you can you can come to know what uh, what proposition is distributing what. So, a, a proposition now you will write it here a proposition distributes subject 
and whereas that means A distributes S and now E proposition distributes both that is subject and predicate this is the one way of remembering it and all there is no standard rational kind of judgment you know so just for the sake of remembering this thing we, we are using this particular kind of mnemonics you know. So E proposition distributes both that is both subject and predicate and then uh, I proposition distributes neither I proposition in a sense some men are mortal some X or Y some cats are animals etc. I proposition distributes neither that means neither subject nor predicate and then O proposition in this case distributes only predicate P stands for predicate and O stands for O proposition distributes predicate. So now you need to note that this uh, whether or not this particular kind of distribution is satisfactory or not is a, a very difficult question to answer there are some propositions categorical propositions in which uh, for example it is an universal affirmative proposition A proposition all uh, bachelors are unmarried people and all for example if you say that thing it appears to be the case that uh, of course it is an A proposition it will distribute subject only because unmarried people are referring to the whole of uh, it is talking something about the whole class of uh, bachelors and all so it means S is distributed no doubt about it but unmarried people is nothing but uh, bachelors only so bachelors also seems to be distributed to the whole of unmarried kind of people and all so it appears to us that here both subject and predicate are distributed and all. So this is what is going to set some kind of limits to Aristotelian theory of distribution and all, distribution of terms. And all. There are some cases in which, uh, yeah, although it is an A proposition, but it distributes both predicate and subject and all. So that is not what we are going to look for, but in the in most of the cases, uh, what happens is a, a proposition distributes S and E proposition distributes both subject and predicate I proposition distributes neither of them whereas O proposition distributes predicate that is what is the uh, actual standard theory of uh, Aristotelian theory of syllogism. So now we apply this uh, five different kind of rules to these two syllogisms and we will see uh, what syllogism is valid and what is invalid. Now. So now the first rule is this particular kind of thing distribution of of middle term so this is the first rule so now we will look for this particular kind of rules now there are five rules which Aristotle could come up with and based on that you can judge whether a given syllogism is valid or not so now we are applying on these two syllogisms this is one and this is two which we discussed it already but we are applying these rules here. So now coming back to this particular kind of thing so now here the middle term first you need to identify these things middle term middle term is what C and then uh, so the other terms are like this so uh, we have other terms A and B which you forget about it you know whether it occupies the subject position or predicate position based on that we have other terms you know first you identified the middle term you know. So this rule says that the middle term should be distributed at least once in the premises you know because middle term does not occur in the conclusion so there is no question of uh, distribution in the conclusion. So the middle term should be distributed at least once in the premises you know. So now so what is this proposition this is an E proposition. So now E proposition distributes both subject and predicate and all that means the middle term is distributed here. So now that means we have satisfied this particular kind of criteria that a middle term should be distributed at least once in the premises and all so that is already satisfied and all of course you can look for other thing and all all C's are A that means uh, here C is the middle term and all. Now if it is a subject uh, A proposition A proposition distributes only S that means uh, 
what is the subject term here C is the subject term so that so C is said to be distributed here since it is a a proposition a term is said to be distributed if it is talking about something which is referring to the whole of that particular kind of class which the term is referring to. So C is referring to and A is distributed to the whole of C and all so that is why C is said to be distributed and all. Suppose if it is partially distributed etc and all then that is said to be non distribution and all. This is the one which we have explained it in the last lecture. So now the first rule seems to be satisfied because middle term is distributed at least once in the premises and all. So it is distributed here and here also. So now the second rule is, is that no term is distributed in the conclusion which is not distributed in the premises and all. So now here B is the term and then A is the term which you are seeing it in the conclusion. So no term is distributed in the conclusion which is not distributed in the premises now if that means if it is distributed in the conclusion it has to be distributed in the premises as well. So now this is a E proposition that means both both terms both subject and predicate terms are distributed now so that means B is distributed and E A is also distributed. So, so now that means in the premises at least these two terms I mean at least one of these things should be distributed at least once and all. So now here um, in this case uh, one second. So in this particular kind of thing so no C is B again it is an E proposition it distributes both of them. So that means B is also distributed so con distribution conclusion and premises. So if your term is distributed in the conclusion it has to be distributed in the premises also at least once and all. So that means B is here anyhow distributed and all so this rule is also satisfied and all and there are some other kinds of rules which we need to look for so that is uh, if uh, any valid syllogism has one positive and one negative premises then its conclusion is negative and all. So here at least one negative proposition is there here so this is because A and I propositions are affirmative and A E and E and O are negative propositions. So you find one negative proposition here that means your conclusion also should be negative and all in the same way vice versa also the same thing. Suppose if you find a negative kind of conclusion here then you should have at least one negative kind of propositions in the categorical 